Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. My goal is to find exceptional people that are doing really cool and interesting things in their fields and uh, interview them and you know get information out of them that you may not find when you just read an article about them online. I want to go deeper and find out the juicy stuff. So today I have Ben Berwick. He's the founder and director of Prevalent Architecture. We're going to talk about uh, solar panels, but uh, essentially an origami version of, of solar panels so you can use them in places you probably otherwise couldn't. So Ben, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I hope I got it right. Tell me about uh, Prevalent. What's the premise of the company and what do you guys do? Right. So, so Prevalent effectively is, a, is an architecture company. Um, we were founded about three years ago, uh, 2017. So we're looking in a way to, to move architecture away from what's become almost a niche service, uh, service back into to prominence in a way, um, leveraging sort of benefit of architecture, not just for the select few. Um, but, but really for, for the wider community. So architecture these days, depending on the country that you're in, um, uh, roughly about 5% of, of constructed buildings are designed by architects themselves. So we're really looking at what can, what can the architect do and how can we move them back into prominence? Um, so in effect, Prevalent itself focuses on the advocation of sustainable systems uh, with, within buildings, within projects. And that's at a, a different range of scales. So all of the projects are underpinned by a strong sustainability agenda. Um, through the use of material and synthesis with the natural environment. Um, and basically, we create and implement these systems, whether that's in uh, more standard regular buildings, so larger scale, or whether it's in sort of smaller product-based uh, applications, such as, such as a Solgami screen. So what's, um, this is primarily for solar, for personal use, or um, like what do you imagine the, uh, the, the uses of this would be? Yeah, so um, maybe we should explain a little bit what the Solgami screen is, is first. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's a, it is a window screen, um, goes in your windows, can replace curtains in a way. Uh, it's 20 millimeters deep. We call it a, like a pass through solar retrofit device. Uh, in the end, we link greater natural illumination of an internal environment, like an apartment or an office building or a hospital, um, you know, anywhere with solar access with windows. We link mm-hmm. that relationship of the internal illumination with energy generation um so yeah i mean we have we have a, a really quite a wide range of uses well um what about the storage capacity so you know i have like mm-hmm. you know, imagining like my, my room in my house and you know a lot of my house mm-hmm. there's you know there's plenty of places where it'd be nice to collect solar energy um right but what about storing it so i can collect it you know i was going to ask you okay like let's say i have like this, this one big wall on my house that you know is just sitting there uh, what mm-hmm. if i put solar on it could I store it and over time, would that be a substantial amount of energy or do I have to use it as I collect it? Yeah, so, so we're looking at two different options and one is running back into the grid from, from the solar panels themselves um, and the other would be to store in batteries um, within an apartment or within a building. So for a lot of people, we have, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a field called building integrated photovoltaics <clears throat> and that, that's dealing with effectively solar cells maybe on the facade of a building um, sort of on the outside of newly constructed buildings, where our niche is more so looking at if you have a building that is already constructed that's already existing, um, which of course, you know, by the, I think by the year 2050, uh, 60% of buildings have already been constructed um, today that will be in use in that year. So we're really looking at the vast majority of buildings as opposed to a smaller niche of newly constructed buildings. So in that sense, as opposed to, you know, put, putting the solar cells on the facade, we're actually looking at areas where an individual user can put them, which is which is within the window space. So you could be renting an apartment. Uh, in that case, it might be more beneficial to run back to the grid. Um, for other cases, it might be more beneficial to run back to a battery. Yeah, I would think uh, landlords, you know, unfortunately may not be on board, you know, mm-hmm. with people using solar. What, what have you seen when people are in apartments and stuff? I mean, um, you know, if I have this on the windows I have in my apartment, let's say, is this going to be any substantial amount of solar or is it kind of uh, minor? The amount I can collect. 
Yes. So, so at the moment, we have a three-year track um, to really to answer your question um, in detail uh, in terms of the actual research that's involved. Um, because, because at the moment, it's quite an, uh, an advanced geometry that we're synthesizing for the window environment. Um, we prefer to measure, how to say, uh, the, the effect that you're getting through the reflected light within your room or within your space um, to give a sense of the feeling that you are generating electricity. In terms of the amount, we'd like to say that, you know, between maybe 6 a.m. and 6.30 a.m., you know, whilst you're waking up, you're getting this redirected light inside your room. And by the time you've woken up, you are getting, you know, enough electricity to power for your breakfast, to make your breakfast fit for the day, this sort of thing. Um, more tangible results to energy generation as opposed to the pure number. Uh, however, that will come with, with the further research that's underway. Why not uh, go after landlords? You know, if a landlord has a, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, a 20-unit building, and you say to him, hey, let's cover the whole building and the solar stuff. And mm -hmm. if he does, you know, I don't know, let's say he could offer a very slight, you know, either offer or not offer a very slight discount to the rents for his renters. And then exactly, um, you know, they exactly. would be using solar and, and it would be, I don't know, you, I would think you get a lot more juice out of it, literally. Right. So, so we are looking at so many different applications. Uh, the project went public about a year ago. Um, and from them, we've had different inquiries from countries that you may not expect interest in solar um, from, you know, the very, very top of Norway and Canada uh, to, to countries around the equator um, and to, to the very south of Australia. Um, so we've had lots of interested people in different parties and they have varied from individual users um, to people, say, in caravans and mobile homes uh, to entire hospitals, buildings, towers, um, energy companies. A whole, a whole range of different interested parties. So, so yeah, in the end, there won't be just one size sort of fits all approaching. Approaching a developer that's creating a new building is one option, is one way. Um, also the end user as well. As a product itself, once it's in mass production, uh, is also is also a feasible, a feasible direction for us. So yeah, there's, there's lots of different um, avenues with which the product can take. Well, that's what I mean. What, in your analysis, what do you think will be the mm. most fruitful ones? You know, like, the most mm. unique thing about what you do is what? The fact that it's the solar production is like origami, origami and it can be put into spaces that really can be anywhere. It's a much mm -hmm. more um, variable footprint than where you can normally go. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is definitely one of the benefits. But the main unique aspect of what we're doing is the solar cell itself is placed horizontally in, in the window, um, in the screen itself. So we're redirecting light across the surface of the solar cell and it's reflecting back into the room. So the screen itself is made up of two different aspects. One's a solar cell, uh, and then there's an optical coating that's printed onto that. The optical coating splits light between visible and infrared spectrums. So the visible is reflected back into the room, kind of like a light tunnel or a light channel, um, and the infrared itself is absorbed by the solar cell for the energy. So in that way, we're then creating a, a brighter internal environment. Um, so you're getting more light redirected inside. Uh, and then you're also generating electricity. So that, that's the really unique aspect. Um, and we know that you know, uh, health is really related to natural illumination. Uh, and this is sort of an ongoing area of research. It's becoming quite prominent as well um, as our cities become more dense. So we've had a number of hospitals looking at the relationship between health and their patients in, in wards and, and that sort of space. Um, looking at a screen like this to redirect light deeper inside the floor plate, natural illumination. Um, and then also generate electricity to probably cover the cost of the screen and then also later in its life generate um, um, energy that way as well. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's really the, the unique aspect of it. Well, all right. I mean, what, what's the quality of the infrared that you'd capture? You know, how much, uh, what kind of efficiency do you get and where, you know, okay, so you're, you're capturing it. Then where does the electricity go? What can, what can it be used for? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, whatever energy we're capturing would go into a, you know, a small, a small transformer box, um, and then it can go back into the grid or into a, to a battery to be used by whatever the end user would require that for. Um, so, so yeah, in, in a sense, the energy can be used for, for anything if it's going back into the grid. But again, the quality is good enough, um, even though it's infrared and not like, let's say, yeah. full spectrum. Yeah, yeah. So you'd be, you'd be getting infrared, um, a, bit of, a bit of UV as well. Uh, depending on the solar cell that we're using, um, it will capture... Uh, more energy from different spectrums. So we're focusing on ones that are infrared and UV as opposed to visible light. And visible light is, is such a small part of the energy generation of some solar cells. Um, so, so in that sense, it, it's not completely different. 
Um, you'll even find a lot of solar cells, more traditional silicon that are placed on top of buildings. Um, they have a lot of problem with reflection uh, and, and glare that are produced from them. So in a sense, that's how we came up with this was, you know, there is this problem, anti-reflective coatings are really quite a, quite a big business on solar cells. So why don't we explode what's at a nanoscale and anti-reflective coating into an actual screen um, and use those reflections for the benefit of people inside? Um, inside internal buildings that aren't getting much of natural light. So even existing uh, solar cells, I mean, I don't know if this would lay over the solar cell. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you take your learnings and make a coating for existing solar cell coverings, you know, for the glass or whatever it is, and, uh, you know, but using right, the same right. methodology that you're using? Have you thought about that? Right. So we're actually researching with two different universities here in Sydney, uh, and one is focusing on the optical coating that is going onto the printed solar cell. Um, I believe there, there, is, there is one company in Switzerland that is currently producing, starting to produce one of these coatings um, for building integrated photovoltaics, which is for the facade itself, uh, where you can alter the color and the, the effect that you're getting of the solar cells. So you can have a red one, a white one, a blue one. It, it's quite in its infancy, um, but that does exist. So you can change the visual effect of the solar cell. Our research is taking that in a way one step further. Um, as opposed to varying the color, we'd probably stick with a white because once you're reflecting light, um, the light that's reflected after that is then obviously influenced by the surface. So for a whiter light inside, we're using a white coating. Um, what's interesting for us is to, to vary the reflectivity of that surface. Um, so if we have greater reflectivity, you're reflecting more light inside and you're generating less electricity. Less reflectivity, you're absorbing uh, more light, so you're having more energy effects, more energy generated, but less light reflected inside. So <clears throat> In, in a sense, um, the current interest we have from different parties around, around the world, it really depends. People in Norway and, and Northern Canada were really looking at, they wanted greater natural illumination. That was something they really focused on. Um, so for them, having a more reflective surface, surface makes a lot more sense. Uh, for, for other people, say in, uh, in Australia, there's some towers that they really face west and they get quite a harsh sun in the afternoon. So they wanted, in effect, almost no reflectivity on it. Um, for it to absorb all the energy it could and to not transfer light back inside to the, the apartment. What about um, the, um, yeah. I mean, sunlight changes throughout the day. Morning mm. light is different from, you know, afternoon and evening. I mean, how sophisticated is our solar cells? Are they at the point yet mm. where, depending on the time of day, they'll harvest light in a certain way or not and change their characteristics? You know, maybe they use like piezoelectrics or something to uh, change mm. the nature of the reflectivity so it allows certain frequencies in and not others you know, to go along with, again, the, the natural variations in light. Right, exactly. So for the, for the end user, that will depend on the orientation that the window is facing, of course, um, to, to what kind of light they're getting, whether it's morning, uh, afternoon, or during the day. Um, for us, though, it's a geometrical question. So the, the solar cells are placed horizontally in a screen uh, within the window, and then the front of the screen itself uh, if you open and close the screen side to side, like a concertina, the front of the screen itself uh, will rotate and the rotation adapts to the different changes of light throughout the day. So, because a large part of this is redirecting light inside. Sometimes you'll want a lot of light inside, other times you won't. Uh, it, could be, it could be distracting, for example. So if you open and close the screen, say 50% open and closed or 80%, the actual geometry of the screen hinges almost like an elbow to redirect light different in different ways inside. Um, so yeah, so we're answering this in, in like a, in a geometrical question and hence the, the origami itself. Uh, the origami is related to because we're printing the, the solar cells flat effectively and folding into shape. Uh, this is why we're using origami. And then from that three dimensional shape, the opening and closing of the screen, the constant name um, of the screen itself redirects light in different ways inside based on different times of the day. So yeah, I mean, urban light is very, is very complicated. You have buildings in front of you, you have different reflections, you have different times of the year as well as different times of the day. Um, in effect, to design a custom panel that relates to all of it would not be feasible. Uh, so in, in a sense, the user can actually open and close the screen a little bit to change the effect they're getting. Is it possible to do a, a mini little transformer so that you could have a, um, you know, a solar covering on a window and plug it into the wall? Mm -hmm. so it goes through a tiny little transformer, you plug it in the wall, and I don't know if it's configured properly, but it would feed electricity back through the, uh, you know, the wires in the wall and generate it yeah, that way. So or is that just crazy? Technically, technically, I believe you can. Um, it depends on the regulation of the country. 
to which to which you're installing it. I, I think in America you cannot. Um, but yeah. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, you can. So I mean, that that is quite an efficient mechanism with which you could uh, generate electricity back to the grid, transfer it back to the grid. Uh, it just depends on the regulation of the country um, and in terms of the tariffs with which you're putting energy in or taking energy out and how the system works. Um, it's definitely well, would you feasible. consider that, uh, I mean, do you think that's a great application of it or what's your thought? Like, what's the ideal, I mean, like, you know, if you yep. could have your dream, what would it look like right now? What, how would your devices be used and what would they do? Right. So it'd be in, in any, generally in urban context. So, you know, in a city. Um, as an architect, we face this with cities are becoming obviously more and more populated, more dense. Um, in a way, to live in a city is quite a sustainable argument, and it, it's generally a good thing. But we're seeing now um, it's becoming slightly less healthy due to less light in new buildings, uh, and, and health and light are so inexplicably linked. So, you know, to have this in areas where you're having just such little light, in a lot of apartments you have this, um, that, that would be one of the main goals, to have in a lot of different apartments and to, to increase internal illumination, natural illumination of the apartments themselves. Um, that's one major goal. Other major goal would be yeah, to have it in hospitals and areas of health and to see the actual health benefits of the light on, on the hospital wards and different areas. Um, it's also an argument to be said for productivity of workers. Uh, some, some offices have seen productivity increases of up to 60% by using natural illumination as opposed to artificial. You know, these, these are really oh, sure. massive, in, these are really massive increases and it becomes quite an economical argument once you explain it that way. Um, and especially to, to businesses, once you base it on productivity, uh, then, then it becomes almost a no brainer. So there's so many different, uh, aspects and, and applications for the device because natural illumination is related to, to you know, it's, it's related to everything that we do. Mm, yep, definitely. What, uh, so how's the reception been? What, what kinds of uh, businesses are, are interested and which ones, mm. uh, sadly, surprisingly, are not? Right. So, so we uh, took the project public with the, uh, the Lexus Design Award about a year ago. Um, and the response was quite, was quite phenomenal. We had, you know, many, many a thousand of articles around the world just uh, discussing the project. Um, from that, we had many different interested parties from some of the world's biggest uh, energy energy companies um, that, were, that were quite interested. I believe some some still leverage it for their for their gain in a way to appear green, um, as you know this is this is something we could be doing. So there has been support from energy companies in terms of image and branding and marketing, uh, in terms of in terms of finance or cooperation. Though no, not yet. Um, response from the public has been overwhelming. So we, we exhibited in Milan Design Week last year. Uh, at that point, I think there's about 60,000 people that passed through the exhibition. It was basically unanimous support. It's, it's quite an unusual technology that we're developing and nothing really exists quite like it yet. Um, so in that sense, to test the public opinion was really, really crucial to actually see, you know, are people interested in this? Is this, is this something that, you know, could, could be the future of how we do window furnishings in a way? Um, and the answer seemed to be yes. So, yeah, a lot of individuals, uh, a lot of hospitals, uh, a lot of different universities, energy companies, um, a couple of governments around the world, um, two, two different countries who are quite interested. Um, yeah, it really, really varies um, when it comes down to it. And when it comes down to securing funding, it generally becomes a different story. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's true. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we're going for Australian government grants, um, which do seem to be promising. So, mm, okay. And, and again... How much energy can be created based on someone's average window or, you know, the way in which someone will use it on average? Do you have calculations or like a handy guide? You know, if you, <laughs> if you have a window covering of this size, then this is about what you'll get, et cetera. Yeah, that's, that's, the, question, that's the question that's being asked. Um, look, we, we have done, we've done ge geometrical prototypes, uh, prototypes that work in every sense, but are not yet generating the electricity. Um, we've also done ones with the solar cells itself. Um, but not bolted into shape. To combine the two, to do a fully working prototype is, is our next step. Um, and from that, we'll be able to get the, the numbers. So a, a little bit of a way up yet, um, just due to the complexity of the system. Have you looked at fractals for uh, you know, the design of the, the screen itself or any of the elements mm -hmm. of the solar system? Because, you know, I mean, nature uses them a lot and uh, they're used in antennas that have really, you know, that, that work really well. So maybe it's just something to think about. Right, right. Um, you know, in, in, in a sense, it's, it's not, it's not completely different. This is a, in a way it's a component based system of repeating elements. 
Um, and those repeating elements do do change shape and distort over time based on uh, input of the user to open and close the screen. In a, in a sense, it is, it is based um, on natural, natural elements uh, in its very core. However, once you come to production processes um, that we've inevitably had to, had to arrive at, uh, some of that will slink away, um, but it's definitely still based there. It still is a repeating element, repeating element that changes slightly in the forms. Um, beyond that, though, in terms of actual relation to fractals, you know, not not exactly. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. just, uh, just an idea. So, well, very mm. good. Where, is this available? Where, what countries, and the, how can listeners find out more? How can they see it, you know, watch a video, experience it, and hopefully maybe order one? Not now, then soon. Right, right. So um, there's more information available on prevalent.archi. So that's website prevalent.archi. Um, at the moment, we are in the research phases with two different universities in Australia. Um, we are taking interest through the website. Um, that helps that helps build our case for funding effectively. Um, and at the moment, we're applying for government grants. You know, ho hopefully, hopefully, we're reaching production maybe in the next uh, three years. It would be, it would be nice to do. There is a lot involved in terms of mechanism, in terms of coatings, um, research as well. Mm. So some sometime within within the next three years, um, although we hope to have a working prototype within the next year. Okay, well, very good. Well, Ben, thanks for coming, and it's a great idea. I mean, it has uh, tons of applications. I think it'll be a fantastic thing. So, you know, I hope you uh, you get going on it, and uh, like I said, you have you have success, and I I'm able to get one soon. Thank you for being here. Perfect. Thank you, Richard. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.